Hello, hello, and good evening to everybody out there. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're doing fantastic. And welcome to Pint of Science 2021 from the city of Portsmouth. I'm Kyle Marson, and tonight we've got a fantastic show. And well, the subject of the show is I'm absolutely covering it. It's paleontology. I've got my hat, I've got my necklace, and I've got my shirt on, and we are raring to go. But before we get into our fantastic speakers tonight, I do want to mention that there are some feedback forms for yourselves to fill out. And tell us what you enjoyed about the show and any feedback you can give us, guys. And also, Pint of Science are doing a prize draw of those forms on their Twitter page. So, hey, hope you could be within the chance of winning a prize. And <laughs> basically, if you want to question, give any questions to any of our speakers tonight, don't be afraid to go to the comments section below and ask our speakers a question or any questions to do with paleontology in general. Now, if you haven't sussed out, we love science here. We eat, we breathe, we sleep, and we everything science. Like our first speaker tonight, Dr. Mark Hardiman. Now, Dr. Hardiman is a lecturer of environmental, uh, environmental systems at the University of Portsmouth and is <coughs> Excuse me, and is fascinated with time and space. But tonight, he's going to talk to us about wildfires in the British Isles, looking at their past, their present, and their future. So, without further ado, uh, delay, Dr. Hardiman. Thank you very much, Carl. That was a very enthusiastic start, which I like. Yeah, so today, over the next 12 minutes, I am going to try and take you through... Uh, wildfire in the British Isles. Now, of course, you know, wildfire is something that we see in the news, often affecting other parts of the world, California, Australia, the Southern Mediterranean. Um, and tonight, in 12 minutes, I want to give you a sort of a history of where we are now and where we may be headed in terms of wildfire and uh, the British Isles. Um, and so just to begin, you know, what is wildfire? So I'm talking about fire, not building fires, I'm talking about fires that affect rural areas, uncontrolled, uh, natural fires that, that burn natural landscapes. Um, yeah, and as I say, it's got three parts really, um, the next 12 minutes. It's got, you know, where have we been? Um, we actually have quite a long history uh, in, in Britain between people and fire and the environment. And I want to give you a little bit of that, a bit of context. I want to just situate where we are now in terms of wildfire in the UK and then I want to think a little bit about where we might be in the future and reasons uh, because reasons behind that. Um, now fires are a very complicated thing there are so many different things that control it um, that, that affect its expression on our landscapes and of course it impacts people, the environment, nature, ecosystems and all sorts of things so it's a, it's a, it's a type of science that is, that is that is thought about by many different types of scientists, chemists, physicists, geographers, geologists, even paleontologists, people that consider how does fire change through time? How is it impacting our environments now? So let's just start with a quick, uh, you know, a quick prehistory of fire, if you will, uh, for the British Isles. And so and this is some of the reasons that I've been directly involved with. So one thing we can say for sure is that fire, wildfire has been part of British Isles long before humans, Homo sapiens, our species, arrived on these islands. Um, and we have ample evidence of that. And so you might be thinking, well, what's, what's causing those fires if it's not people? Well, you know, most natural fires on Earth are caused by lightning, uh, particularly lightning without rain, um, that strike dry landscapes that can obviously spark uh, wildfires. And so we know the British landscape, even before people, even before Homo sapiens arrive, is flammable, can burn. Um, uh, what about the arrival of people then? So, you know, since sort of the, the Mesolithic, the British landscape has been permanently occupied all year round. And we know um, that these early people would have used fire, not just for warmth and remember, uh, hominin species have used fires for millions of years. Um, but also there's some evidence during the Mesolithic and Neolithic that people were actually burning the landscape in the UK. So, you know, there's lots of reasons you might do that to encourage, you know, fresher fruit to grow, to drive game out for your hunting and all sorts of things. There's a quite complicated, long relationship between the human uh, story of our islands and also the fire story of our islands. Um, and in particular, when the Neolithic, that's when people start farming, they start, you know, making permanent residence um, and we start to get big landscape clearances, we, we have some evidence that some of that was being done by wildfire. And in fact, some of the ecosystems we have, particularly in the south of England, near us here in Portsmouth, 
uh, particularly heathlands, are actually semi-natural environments. They're probably only there because of people um, removing trees, using things like fire to keep those landscapes clear. Um, so actually some of the interesting, very biodiverse ecosystems we have today are actually probably because of this, this intricate story of humans uh, and fire. So wildfire is not a new thing in the UK. If we move a little bit further on in history, we know um, that, you know, widespread landscape burning has been has been pretty common since the late medieval period. That's about 1272 AD onwards. Uh, and over the last, bringing us right to present, over the last 200 years, you know, upland areas in particular have been rotationally burned, in particular for things like grouse moor management. So fire has essentially been used to, to manage landscapes for particular ecological ends, be it grouse moor uh, and other things as well. So we have a long history on these islands of, of, of using anthropogenic fire. And also Britain has natural wildfire as well. It's not just people that cause fire in the UK, although presently, predominantly, we are the main cause of it. So that's just a brief history. If I bring you to present, then you can see here's just a map of, um, of England where we've got good data. And you can see we actually have fire all across uh, England. Uh, and mostly it's our open habitats in the UK that burn. Why? Because they tend to dry out more agricultural lands, grasslands, heathlands. Uh, they can dry out in the summer and they're more likely um, to burn. But I just want to point out, if you look at the southeast there, you can see a higher percentage of actually woodland areas. Burn as well. This is just statistics from 2010 to 2016. So actually, we get wildfire across um, the, uh, England and across other parts of the UK and British Isles um, as well. So it's not just it's not look like, it's not very focused on one region. We actually get it across most a lot of regions. The common. Um, just, just to move on, let's look at some large wildfire events of recent times. So here's the Swinley Forest Fire in Berkshire. This was 2011. So we're actually just taking the tenth anniversary of this particular fire. Now, this is a really interesting fire. Most of the fires we get in the UK are what we call uh, surface fires. You know, they stay at low level. You can sort of bat them down or they're fairly easy to control. Swinley Forest Fire was a little bit of a surprise because it was what we call a crown fire. The fire moved into the tree canopy. And this is the sort of thing we're used to seeing in other parts of the world. Um, but in this case, we saw it um, in southern England. And it was a huge fire over 300 hectares of forest. Uh, were burnt, it's the largest fire in Berkshire's history, and over a thousand people were directly affected, had to be evacuated. A main road, A road, was closed down for a week, um, uh, and over 200 personnel were required to put this fire out. So it was a bit of an eye opener, actually. After this fire, the UK government suddenly came up and said, Hang on a minute, is our fire sort of landscape changing in the UK? Just to bring us further to present, here's a, one from earlier this year. Um, this is in the Mourne Mountains. This is actually a gorse fire. Gorse is uh, that prickly stuff you often you often find in uh, heathlands and other dry areas near the coast. Very flammable. And this is a really big, again, it's a kind of spectacular fire you don't expect to see in the UK. Uh, a really difficult fire to deal with by the fire service because it's obviously a quite mountainous um, area. Again, over, over, over 365 rugby pitches worth of damage to this quite, quite important habitat. To bring us a bit closer to um, to Portsmouth, this is and to my home county, Dorset. Um, just uh, last year uh, in May, with the Wareham Forest Fire. So again, this was only unusual fire for the UK because it's a fire that actually started to enter the tree canopy. And you see, this is a picture just from about a month ago, and you can see you can still see evidence of this burning. And this is a triple SI site, really important ecosystem, uh, and a really large fire over 220 hectares. Um, that burned for over two weeks. And in fact, to put this out, uh, the local fire service actually employed helicopter uh, deployment of water bombs and stuff to try and stamp this fire out, and they eventually did. Um, are these unusual? You know, we're seeing a lot more UK wildfires in the news. Are we living in a different time here? It's some statistics. As a scientist, I like numbers. And you can see you've got numbers of fires in orange and you've got burn area in red. And you can see we don't have a particularly long record um, of this, it just goes back to 2008, but you can see the last few years in 2011 picking up that Swinley Forest fire, we are starting to see more fires in the UK, larger fires and perhaps higher number of fires. Um, what's causing this is a really tricky question. Uh, obviously, there is climate change. We know our environment and climate is changing. And we also know that a uh, uh, senior fire service officer in the UK is saying that they're experiencing you know, more wildfires and longer burning seasons where the landscape is vulnerable to burning. Um, so this seems to be something we are detecting. 
Um, I'm not going to show you a, a temperature plot because you've all seen that on the news all the time, um, you know, about how we're living in a warming world. Uh, but here's, here's a really nice uh, plot, you know, trust trees. This is a really famous uh, piece of work by uh, Gene Coombs, who's been studying a local tree in a village since 1947. And basically, there's a particular oak tree in a village. And, uh, and what Jean has done is she locates every time that oak bud bursts every year. And what you can see is since 1950, that's moved by about 20 days. You know, the trees are responding to the changing environment. Um, and so are other systems, you know. So we know if we look forward in time, and here's sort of a, a weather forecast from from sort of 2060, 2080, um, you know, this is going to be, we get days like this at the moment. We had 33 degrees in Portsmouth a few years ago for a few days. Um, but by 2080, this will be a normal day, not an unusually warm day, a normal day. This is going to have an impact on uh, how wildfire expresses on our landscape. Um, hot summers are expected to become more common. Uh, summer rainfall is likely to be lower. We're likely to get warmer summers and warmer, wetter winters. And what that means is we're probably going to get more vegetation growth in the UK because things get warm quicker. Things can start growing quicker. Um, you'll have to start cutting your lawns quicker earlier in the year. And what that does, it allows fuel to build up. If you then have a long, dry summer, a Mediterranean-like complexion, perhaps, um, that can then dry out. And that's where you get classical wildfires. So essentially, parts of the UK, particularly the southeast, we're going to start to see more, uh, probably more wildfire going forward into the future. And we need to be prepared for this. We need to sort of think about this and how we're going to deal uh, with this threat. So some, some things we see to the south is going to be approaching us in the southeast. I don't want it all to be bad news. You know, going forward uh, by 2100, we're going to get some quite nice, uh, you know, grape growing. So here's a really nice study that shows, you know, by 2100, um, we're actually going to grow some quite nice red wines in the southeast. So, you know, and these are regions that we know today, Italy, Spain, etc., cetera, um, parts of southern France, where they get big wildfires. And, you know, with that ability to grow nice wines or different wines in the UK, we're going to have an increase at wildfire risk. Here's a little bit of modelling that's been done. It's quite hard to model wildfire because fire, it's a phenomenon. You know, you can have a landscape that's ready to burn that doesn't for whatever reason. Um, but, you know, uh, here's some work that has been done by the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment Group. And what you can see is to the to the left there, this is the, the forest fire danger rating index uh, from 1970 to 2000. And this is and then to the right, you can see what it's going to be from 2070 to 2100. And you can see in particular, England, the southeast, is going to become more prone to wildfire. And perhaps we're starting to see that with some of these fires um, that I've already indicated, like the Swindley Forest fire. Um, so we're going to have to prepare for this. Uh, and people are, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the moment. Um, what we get a lot in places like the southeast, and particularly counties like Surrey, just to the, to the north of us here in Hampshire and Portsmouth, we get a lot of this. Um, here's, here's a site just north of Christchurch in Dorset actually um, but you get sites of this in Surrey as well and I really like this is a Google Earth image this is the urban rural interface and what you can see here at this site you've got heathland to the back you've got woodland areas and you've got people because of course people like to live in houses next to trees you know trees look nice and lovely you know fires can start really commonly in these heathland open and also get gorse and stuff as well in these areas and if we live in a warmer climate, it might be that they're going to be more able to penetrate trees and get crown fires. This is going to start to pose a risk to people living in these areas, uh, in these houses. Um, and we're going to have to start dealing with that risk and thinking about that risk now and also getting people that live in the UK, particularly in the south, but also other parts of the UK, used to the idea that, you know, wildfires are a thing that we're going to need to think about. So it's a challenge. But the good news is, because I don't like to be all doom and gloom, is that people are starting to think about this. Lots of people are starting to think about this in the UK. You know, we're going to plant 11 million trees in the UK over the next few decades as part of uh, capturing CO2, uh, you know, uh, carbon capture. Um, you know, we need to make sure we plant forests today that are going to be all right in the climate of 2100, which is going to be different to today. Um, so we need to build wildfire resilience into our woodlands as well as, as, as other resilience. We need to think about things like, you know, should we allow people to use um, barbecues out in the open in areas which we know are going to be more flammable or is that a risk we shouldn't take already actually just this year Dorset and Hampshire have already banned barbecues in some areas to try and reduce the risk of uncontrolled wildfires which cost a lot of money to deal with the Swinley forest fire cost a million pounds 
to, to cope with. We're also building, and this project I'm involved with, a UK fire danger rating system. There's one, there's one being developed for Scotland as well. The UK has a really interesting mosaic landscape and we need to understand that because it's pretty unique and it will have unique challenges um, for wildfire. And people as well, just finally, like the Met Office are considering wildfire and they already produce a wildfire map. You can actually go on the Met Office type Met Office wildfire risk and it'll give you a little risk map of the UK. Where are the risks of fire today um, or not? But I'll leave that. But hopefully you've learned something new about wildfire. If nothing else, you've got had a glimpse into where we've been and where we're going with wildfire in the UK. But I'll leave that there. Well, oh, thank you very much, Dr. Hardiman. That was a very interesting talk, and uh, seeing those incredible images of those burning areas definitely set a light underneath me, and I'm guessing everyone else across the UK watching us now. But, wow, it just goes to show we do really need to understand our past and our present to help us in our future. So thank you very much, and can we get a round of applause in the comments for Dr. Hardiman's talk? Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Carl. Now. Moving on, yeah, brilliant. And uh, now we're going to move on to our next talk. And this is, we're moving from earth, wind and fire. I have to make those jokes by contract. Uh, and we're going to move into water, wet and waves with Dr. Laura Cotton. Now, Dr. Cotton is a, another lecturer at the University of Portsmouth, but she deals in the very small world of micropaleontology, particularly looking into small fossils like Romanifera and understanding how they help show us the past environment and past climates of our planet. So without further delay, take it away, Dr. Cotton. Thank you. Um, so yes, I'm talking to you uh, today about some tiny fossils and the big questions that we can answer with them. Um, so when you think of paleontology, classically, people might think of these kinds of fossils. So you have this nice um, big T-Rex that's called Trix that's in the Netherlands. You might think of marine reptiles like the ichthyosaurs you get down here on the south coast, or maybe ammonites or trilobites or lots of shelly things. But you probably don't think of these. So these are foraminifera, and they're incredibly important for understanding pest climate. And much of our understanding of the past uh, six, 65 million years or longer comes from foraminifera and other microfossils as well. So they're super tiny. So you can see here, they have all these beautiful uh, shells, but they're really, really small. So this is a needle, like a sewing needle. And this is a foraminifera within the eye of the needle. And so you can see that they're really, <laughs> really tiny and you have to pick them under a microscope with a paintbrush. But uh, despite their size, we've got a huge amount of knowledge from them. So I guess the most important thing to tell you right at the beginning is what exactly are foraminifera, or forams, as uh, their name's rather long. So they are single-celled organisms. So they're like an amoeba, amoeba or just like, yeah, a single cell. But they're quite smart for a single cell because they grow these intricate uh, tests or shells um, to protect them and just kind of help with their everyday lives. They live in the ocean. And they can live in a few different ways. You get ones that are floating. So these are called uh, planktonic foraminifera and they make up part of the plankton in the ocean. But you also get them living on the seafloor. So these are benthic foraminifera and they can live on the surface of the seafloor or they can live inside the seafloor. And um, there's a huge variety of them. If you include the fossil and the living ones, there's more than 50,000 species. So if you want to start identifying them, um, you have a few to learn, and they have a really long geological record. So the oldest ones are more than 600 million years old, but they didn't have a shell then, so they don't preserve very well, or sometimes at all. And so their estimates for their first occurrence come from molecular data. Um, they become really, really common around 200 million years, well, they start becoming more common around 200 million years ago in the Jurassic. And then we use them from then on to try and reconstruct climates. 
So as I said, you get some of them that are alive, and this is a picture of a living one here. And you can see that this middle kind of circle is the uh, shell or the test. And this is the part that you find in the fossil record. All the rest of it is missing because it's squishy and it decays. Um, but they also can have uh, photosymbionts. So these are essentially tiny plants that kind of live in harmony with them, helping them. So they provide protection and the uh, photosymbionts provide energy for them. They also have pseudopods. So all these little sticky threads coming out, these are called pseudopods. And these are used in the planktonic ones. So the floating ones, these are used for buoyancy. So they're bigger and they float more easily. And also almost like a big kind of fishing net, they can catch tiny other creatures. And then they, actually there's some pictures, uh, there's some films on YouTube of them eating. And it's a little bit kind of, it's scary. I'm glad they're not very big because they kind of suck all the juices out of the other little creatures and dissolve them. It's not pretty. Um, but yeah, so they have these. And in the benthic ones, they use their pseudopods to move around as well or attach to things. So why are these tiny fossils so useful? So essentially, one of the reasons that they're really useful is because there are loads of them. So if you collect um, a core or some kind of record from a cliff or something like this, you can make continuous records across millions and millions of years, which is much um, better for finding things out than if you just have one or two fossils spread out. So if we use maybe the T-Rex that I had in the first slide, uh, there are not many T-Rexes found in the world today, so you can't really reconstruct things continuously through time. And if you can have a kind of continuous record of them, you can also do all kinds of other things. So foraminifera are quite uh, useful because they capture the ocean chemistry in their shells. So when they form their shell, they capture some of the uh, chemistry of the oceans inside it, and then it becomes fossilized like a snapshot of what the ocean was doing at that time. And when we dissolve these in the lab today, we can work out past temperature. And this is what this figure is here. So you can see there's this nice wiggly line going through. And this is uh, the last 65 million years of Earth history. And this is the temperature here, and you can see how it changes through time. And this entire record is made from millions and millions of dissolved forum shells. So this is where all this knowledge comes from. So that's what forums are and why they're useful. Sorry, I just see my dog approaching me down here. Uh, but what do I do? Uh, so what is my research about? And what I focus on are reefs and uh, shallow seas. So reefs are really important environments for fisheries, for biodiversity, uh, for coastal protection, for the ocean chemistry, all kinds of things like this. So they're a really important ocean system. And you might kind of think of corals when you think of reefs, but there's all kinds of other organisms in there as well. So there are also um, all kinds of different shells. There are mollusks, there are sea urchins, there are um, calcareous algae. There's um, foraminifera, of course, because we're talking about forums today. So there's a whole kind of diverse array of organisms in there. And so I look at the forums from the reefs. And one of the reasons I do this is because if you were going to sample a kind of fossil coral reef, you can imagine the size of corals and to get an accurate um, kind of number of corals that you found in this ancient reef, you'd need a huge number of samples. Whereas if you sample for these microfossils, because they're so tiny, um, you can take quite a small sample and still get a good idea of how many different species were living there. So as you probably know, climate change is affecting reefs today. So this is a figure showing now and into the future. And you can see that CO2 is changing, dust is changing, there are storms, light levels, nutrients, all these different things are changing. And we really want to know what effect all these changes would have on these reefs so we know what might happen in terms of diversity, what might happen in terms of fishing in future, all these different things. And you can study this uh, by doing culturing, so growing some of these reef creatures in the lab. And this is some work that I did uh, when I was staying in Japan. And these are actually baby forearms here. Uh, so they, they reproduced in the lab, so all these little dots are tiny baby forearms. And this is a setup here that we use to control the amount of CO2 
in the different kind of tanks that we're culturing. And so you can culture different organisms with different kind of uh, environmental changes, but you can't, you can't culture on the scale of uh, nature. So you can't, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you can't culture on the same scale this is happening in the natural world. So you can culture for a few days or maybe weeks or maybe months, but you can't do it for like hundreds of years. And so to kind of get around this, we go to the geological record. So this is that figure from earlier. And you can see that there are two kind of big change areas in this uh, record here. So this is this orange area is the time. It's like my favorite time to study because there's lots going on. But you can see there's a big peak here where the Earth actually gets quite warm. And there's this big drop here, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. And this is known as the Eocene Oligocene transition. And it's the first time we get any kind of ice on the Antarctic. So there are big changes happening in the world at this time. And if you zoom in on that kind of wiggly line curve, you can see that it's not just one sheer drop. You can see that uh, there's different things happening here. So there's an initial kind of decrease, and then it flattens out a bit, and then it decreases again. And so what this is, is between about 34 million years and 33 and a half million years ago, you have this 500,000 years of cooling. And so most of this, uh, most of the kind of cooling part happens at the beginning. And then the second kind of change in this ocean chemistry record is the ice being formed. So it kind of occurs gradually over this 500 year interval. And people had studied this for quite a long time and they knew this change was happening and they knew what was happening in kind of the big wide open ocean. But there was a lot of questions about what was happening in the reef type environment. So you can see, my line has moved here, but you can see that uh, a lot of these lines here and each one of these is a species of reef foraminifera. They all disappear along this line. And this is that Eocene Oligocene transition. So people knew things were dying then in the reefs, but they didn't exactly know why. So they obviously it's a cooling time, so it could be temperature. If you have ice being formed, then because there's so much water going into the ice, the sea level falls. So it could be to do with sea level falling and decreasing the habitat in the reefs, or maybe something else. So it remained a bit of a mystery because one of the problems it is that you get with reef uh, environments is it's really hard to get the chemistry out of it because of the way it's preserved. And so it's really hard to match up those detailed records with what's kind of going on in the reef. And then we found a magical place in Tanzania where you could actually do this. So this is um, in Kilwa in Tanzania, and this is a drilling rig. And we drilled uh, down into the earth here and recovered about 200 meters of core. Um, and one of the special things about this area in Tanzania is that the preservation is really good. So you get all kinds of different microfossils together with really nice preservation. And so you can work out um, what is actually happening there. And you can see one of the forums here and it's beautifully shiny and you can see all the detail. This is a bug because it's my favorite bug from this field trip. So I just put it in. And uh, here's a nice view of just kind of what, where we were working. And so I had these big core records and what I did was I went through and I found where the different reef forums were and where they disappeared and where their extinction level was. And then we could match this up with the chemical record that shows where that big shift in uh, global temperature and the sea level fall is. And what we found was that the uh, forums actually didn't go extinct when it was getting quite cold and they didn't go extinct when uh, the sea level fall was falling. They were just going extinct in this kind of flat bit in between where nothing much was really happening. So we were like, what is going on? And since then, I've looked at um, quite a lot of other fossils from this record. And what we think is going on, um, because there are also extinctions in the planktonic forums, so the floating forums, and also um, in various other organisms, there's changes as well. What we think is going on is that there's increasing nutrients so that it's not um, the sea level or the cooling directly, but there are changes in ocean circulation going on 
that are causing these foramen extinctions because like corals they like those really clear waters and I think this is kind of important because it shows that it's not always the obvious factors in climate change that are going to um, have the biggest impact. And it's important that we understand how these systems interconnect to work out what might happen in future. And the other thing to kind of take away from this is also if different um, stresses, if different environmental changes are taking place, sometimes organisms can survive just one thing going on. But when you pair them together, they're like, woof, this is too much, and they just kind of uh, disappear. And so I want you to take away from this that forums and these tiny fossils are incredibly important for understanding pest climates, uh, so much so even the T-Rex here is jealous. That's the end. And I did have some fossil props, but I forgot to show you because I was showing everything there. Look, I've got my echinoid and that forum and uh, a beautiful shell here. These are your nice reef creatures. There we go. <laughs> well, thank you for a, an excellent talk, uh, Laura. It, it just goes to show that with, with Foraminifera, uh, big things do come in small packages and they do have the importance of showing us the past climate and environment and the significance of the ecosystems they're within. So excellent. Excellent talk. Um, can we get a round of applause in the comments for Dr. Cotton's talk? That was an absolutely fantastic talk. Um, and now we've we've accumulated a lot of questions. So hopefully, uh, if we can get Mark back in here, we can get on with the Q and A, and hopefully we can get on with some interesting questions from our viewers. So, I don't think the dogs are interested in the questions. <laughs> So, first question comes from Phil. What is your opinion of the HS2 train route, which is destroying habitat and historical woodlands? Is it worth it? How long would it take to recorporate the environment, do you think? So, I think that's a question for Mark, I believe. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's destruction by train rather than wildfire. Um, I mean, as I said in the talk, um, you know, the plan is in the UK to plant, I think it's up to 11 million trees over the next, I think, few decades, maybe a bit longer than that. Um, and actually, Britain today is more wooded than it has been for about 200 years, believe it or not, um, although it's nowhere near as wooded as it would be naturally. Um, I mean, I, I'm not going to make a call about HS2 because <laughs> that wasn't really what I talked about. But, but it just interestingly, actually, in the age of steam, so when trains first came about because obviously this is not a new sort of worry ever since the steam engine was invented people have been worried about habitat destruction and you know uh the destruction of the sort of the idyllic um but obviously today we have electric trains and, and other trains but steam trains used to actually produce embers and sparks which would actually cause fires strange you know traditional steam trains and even today i know you can go on sort of these historical trains and you might notice sometimes um when they're sort of tutoring along they might stop on your summer holiday and the train driver We'll get out and start batting something down and it's because one of these embers has floated off and started a fire <laughs> and you get this today and because the fire service don't want to be called out for every little thing they'll go out there with one of these rubber these rubber pads and whack it down um and, more, and also the other interesting thing is um you don't see this so much in britain you see it a little bit but in, in big countries like canada actually where you've got train lines or roads often you'll see the anthropogenic fires that very much you see these almost light liquid lines of fire <laughs> where you've got public transport is because of course people park up or get off the train and that's where they start their fires um so you can sometimes see these really like anthropogenic fires because of their pattern they look like spiders webs but they're actually all relating to like um significant um you know transport routes so i haven't really answered the question but um yeah it's an interesting it's an interesting question about trains and fire all right thank you very much and we'll see what the next question is Oh, another one from Phil. Um, is there any innovation like what we have uh, to prevent uh, in preventing flooding uh, available or slash exist to prevent forest fires? Yeah, that's that's a br that's a brilliant question. Thanks, Phil. Um, the answer is yes. Um, as with most things, um, you know, prevention is better than cure. So if you can, you want to try and prevent you having a huge fire to have to deal with by stopping it in the first place, right? And there's actually a lot of things you can do to try and minimise um, the threat of 
fire. One of the things, um, perversely, is prescribed fire. So fighting fire with fire, right? So if you've got an ecosystem that you're worried about that might burn, what you do at a time of the year where perhaps it's slightly damper, but you know the understory will burn, you do what's called a prescribed burn to reduce that fuel load. So rather than letting that dry fuel build up to potentially to a really big fire, which could enter the canopy, you sort of thin it by, by burning. Um, uh, and sometimes and this is a really interesting point because of course, particularly in the UK, when people see prescribed burning, they think that's really bad. They're like, why are they burning that land? Why are they burning that hill? That's really bad, fire bad. But actually it might be to try and protect that environment from a bigger, much more damaging fire, if that makes sense. So, um, so sometimes I think that's where like public education comes in. Obviously, um, in and I mentioned it at the end very briefly, um, but you know, forest design, if you're planting 11 million new trees and you know, planting new forests, um, today, obviously, you know, woodlands live hundreds of years, right? So you need to make sure what you do today is going to be effective in 100 years time. And, you know, certain tree species are much less flammable. Deciduous trees tend to be less flammable than, you know, pines, for instance. Um, but obviously pines are fast growing, so they're better for forestry and economics. But if you can design your woodland so you sort of protect your pines and surround it by trees which are less flammable, then you create a forest uh, sort of um, design which is more... Um, which is more resilient to wildfire. And also, you know, people that live, if you live in, a, in, a, in an area that might burn, you know, there's things you can do to defend your house. I mean, we don't tend to think about it in the UK, but in other parts of the world, it's really common, you know, making sure embers can't drift down your chimney, and set fire to your living room, um, you know, making sure you clear brush from a certain distance of your house, you know, things like that. So the, the answer is, you know, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of things you can do. I mean, in Britain, I mean, and in other parts of the world, very common, you know, you can have, you can, you work with local stakeholders, you know, people, we have a highly managed landscape in the UK, lots of land managers, and, you know, they don't want their landscapes to burn necessarily. They want to defend them against that as well. And if you inform them of policies and things they can do, you know, don't pile up tons of grass that you've sown to a big heap that then dries out and becomes really flammable, right? Because that's definitely, that can become dangerous. Then it, again, you reduce the risk of, of wildfire because with wildfire sometimes you have a landscape which is really dried out it's like it will burn but if you don't get a spark you won't get a wildfire so sometimes it's about reducing that kind of ignition probability so yes the answer to phil's question is yes and a lot about it a lot of it is about thinking ahead of time i mean in terms of fire services because of course you know fire services have to deal with this problem i mean in the uk over the last sort of five ten years uk firefighters have been getting training in places like spain um, I think there's another part of Europe as well, learning from firefighters who deal with these big wildfires, right? What, what are the tips? What equipment do we need? What do we not have in the UK that we're going to need because we're going to get more of these fires? So again, it's about thinking ahead. Um, and the UK government, interestingly, after that Swinley Forest fire, put severe wildfires on the UK risk register. So they realised this is going to be a natural hazard we're going to have to learn to deal with and prepare for. So yes, the answer to, to, to Phil's question. Thank you. Thank you for that great answer, Mark. Um, and now we can move on to a, another question, hopefully. See what, uh, what other questions we've got from our viewers. So, Leah, um, are all the different fram species equally useful for your studies, or are there particular ones you're looking out for? Yes. Um, hi, Leah. <laughs> um, so, some are more useful than others. It's usually to do with um, calibrations, which environment you want to look at, and uh, which forums are actually in your sample. So forums also, when, they're, um, when you're doing geochemistry with them, um, they have a kind of organic kind of biological effect in their fractionation of the ocean chemistry and it varies between species. So if you're looking at a long section or a core, you have to pick something that is present throughout your entire core, otherwise you get slightly different results from things. And also you'd want to think about if you want to look at surface ocean temperatures, you pick planktonic forums. If you wanted bottom water temperatures, you pick ones that live on the bottom, but maybe not the ones that live actually like down in the sediment. So you want to think about what you actually want to find. Uh, for my own studies, I do a lot of assemblage studies. So I look at the entire assemblage of forums to see who's there and who's not and who's surviving and what they're doing. 
So then I just like everyone equally, although I do have favourites. We all have favourites. Uh, thank you for answering thank that. You yeah, for brilliant. The question. <laughs> oh, right, on to our next question. Uh, this one comes from Prisman. Um, and this is a question for you again, Laura. Uh, did you statistically correlate temperature levels with sea level change and parameter diversity and extinction rates? Me personally, no, but it has been done. So there's a huge number of uh, foreign researchers out there. As you can imagine, it's quite a popular field in terms of uh, climate research and also for evolution as well, because you have so many forums um, and so many continuous records, you can really look at how they evolve. And so I think probably a really nice paper on this is one by Tom Ezard at Southampton, who looks at forum diversity through time and what's driving it and things like this. Um, and yeah, there's quite a few studies that, that look into this and there is kind of a connection between what's going on. Um, for what I do, I think we need more data to be able to do it because actually uh, the forums and the reef forums that I work on are a little bit kind of weird compared to the kind of regular forums that they use for climate. They're single cells, but they get really, really big. So uh, this is actually one of them. So uh, it's a single celled organism and the reef ones in the Eocene, so like 40 million years ago, could get up to almost 15 centimeters in diameter and they were still, still a, a single cell. Um, and we've also been looking at things like whether temperature and um, other kind of environmental factors were driving this this size through time, as well as extinctions and things like this. So there are some really good papers out there if you're interested in following this up. Okay, brilliant, yeah, thank you very much. I hope that answers uh, Presby's uh, question. Uh, hopefully we can get another question. Ah, here we go, uh, Indominus Rex 01. Dr. Laura Cotton, how do you predict our interpretations of prehistoric environments will, uh, will change in the future through discoveries in Framanifera? That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wait, the question's gone again. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> Sorry. Um, how will I, okay, so I think, so you're asking about a future, I think there's an increasing level of proxies. So these kind of geochemical proxies from the ocean water, we have a lot for temperature and they're always getting more accurate as to what we can do. Uh, there are also kind of um, different proxies we use now. So trace elements in the ocean, things like barium has started being used for nutrients, but it's not fully understood. People commonly use, um, commonly, yes, boron uh, isotopes to look at CO2 levels and pH in the past. So I think that's just kind of, um, increasing knowledge and increasing kind of accuracy of, of proxies. So I think our understanding of the past kind of gets better and better as, as uh, we, we keep working on it. Okay, brilliant. I, I hope that uh, answers uh, Indominus Rex's question, even though um, I'm pretty sure at the end of that film they were dead. But uh, on to the next question. Uh, oh. This one's another one from Phil. Uh, is there, oh, dog's not impressed with that. Uh, is there a particular issue spoken about tonight that we should be focusing on, or are they all, uh, or are they all important to fund equally? Oh crikey, that's that's a big question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I, you know, I I I I, I don't want to get too philosophical, but you know, I, I believe in blue skies research, so I don't I don't think all research necessarily needs you know a, a concrete outcome in terms of modern e you know economic impact or whatever to be important and on the other hand you know some research that does do should should get funded so you know i think a range of research should be funded because we never really know where you're going to learn something really really interesting i think <laughs> That's but other opinions are available i'll share your next grant with me <laughs> i have a question for laura actually can i can i can i call am i allowed to interrupt and <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Look, Laura, which which is your favourite diatom species and why? Forum. 
Forearm, sorry, not diatom, <laughs> forearm species. Did you not listen to my talk? I did, um, sorry. <laughs> I, one of my favourites is, I'm, I'm torn. I really like one called Pilatus Vera. Um, because it's one of the first larger forums I learned to identify, and it's really pretty. I don't have a picture of it today, but it's it's got quite a ornamented kind of outside shell. It's really nice, um, and it, it occurs just before kind of well, it occurs in the Eocene and, and disappears at the Eocene and Liberocene transition. I really like this one. Um, I also like the Numolites because they're really useful, but particularly Numolites fabiani because um, I, did, I spend a lot of time with it. <laughs> and my favorite planktonic forum, you're getting a whole list now, you probably wish you didn't ask, is um, Hent Canina, which is this one with spines on it, uh, that also marks the Eocene and Lugocene boundary. And actually I named my dogs after that, so they're called Hent Canina, after Hent Canina, the forum. <laughs> wow. and have, you, have, you ever, have you ever named a forum? Have you ever discovered a forum species, Laura? Or... Um, Yes and no. So I'm a bit of a lumper when it comes to species. So I found a, a new lineage of forums, but we didn't name it. We just kind of kept the same name, but it has different evolutionary stages. Um, I've had a bryozoan named after me, though. That was cool. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. That is cool. I've never had anything <laughs> named after me. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, right, let's see what our next question is. If you will appear. Have we no more questions? Oh, here we go. Oh, another one from Leah. Um, how do you connect the ocean chemistry to the temperature? So I do a whole lecture on this, which is why I didn't put it entirely in this, this talk. But um, there are lots of different ways. So one of the most commonly used proxies is uh, isotope of oxygen. So there are different isotopes of oxygen. One of them is oxygen 18. And it's slightly heavier than uh, oxygen 16. So when you're looking, when the temperature changes, you get fractionation through evaporation. And this alters the kind of sink of uh, the oceans in terms of the ratio between O16 and O18. And this is what gets locked up in the forearm shells. There's a further kind of complication with this, that when it evaporates, um, the oxygen 18 that does go up preferentially rains down. And if you have ice forming, then that gets locked up in the ice as well. And so ice can have a second effect on the delta, uh, the oxygen isotope record. And that's why we can tell part of that record is from uh, temperature and part is from ice volume because it records both. But the only way that you can tell them apart is by adding in a, a second proxy to pull them apart. And so the other way you can connect um, ocean chemistry to temperature is through magnesium and calcium. So as the oceans get warmer, um, forearm shells and actually shells of other things as well, incorporate more magnesium into them. And so you can look at the magnesium calcium ratios in there to also get temperature. And then there's a lot of kind of modern experiments trying to calibrate uh, for different species and different organisms as well, because you can do similar studies from bivalves and mollusks. Um, there's also some other kind of temperature proxies that are used, but those are the kind of two main ones. All right, okay, brilliant. Um, I've got a question for Mark, actually, so I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt it. But Mark, I was wondering, with the prehistoric record of wildfires, do they tell us anything about the latitude of Britain or anything about the particular temperatures around that time? Uh, um, yes, yeah, so, so I didn't have time in the talk to talk about it, but most of our evidence of prehistoric fire comes from charcoal which is a you know a proxy of fire essentially we know it's formed at high temperatures so probably a byproduct of a fire um so where, where we find it we know that on that landscape somewhere there was burning or that material of some in some other way has been incorporated um i, I don't work so far back in time as laura so I, I stick to the last sort of million years i'm just not brave enough uh, to go further back um 
Uh, and even with fire, even even in more recent periods. But I mean, what, what's interesting in the British Isles, uh, where you get long before people have arrived on the landscape and living in Britain in large numbers, where you get rapid abrupt warmings and abrupt coolings, you tend to get peaks in charcoal, which is quite interesting. So it's wherever you get an abrupt warming or abrupt cooling, for some reason you seem to get more fire on the landscape. Um, and there's probably good reason for that, because if you think about it, if you've got like a nice wooded Britain and suddenly get really cold conditions and ice age, all that vegetation just sort of drops dead, dries out and then probably burns. And also when you get a rapid warming, you know, you're, you're, the, 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 the ignition probabilities all change. So probably where you get really abrupt changes, you get more fire, both warming and cooling, which is quite interesting. Um, doesn't quite answer your question, but um, it's something which is, which is of interesting, obviously, to our own future. Um, but obviously, Britain today is very dominated by by humans, so it's not it's not entirely, you know, um, translatable. But yeah, that's that's what I'd say about that. But that's how we know it's charcoal. We find charcoal in sediments and stuff. You probably, I'm sure, there are some records, Laura, where you can find charcoal and shallow marine sediments alongside four amps. You somewhere in the world. Them, um, you get a lot of charcoal, I think, in the Cretaceous as well. Don't you? Yes, lots of burning uh, in the Cretaceous, <laughs> things, you know where during parts of Earth history where oxygen levels are really high. So oxygen is really important to fire. You, you, you can't get fire without, but when it hits a certain level, you get like a much more reactive atmosphere. So you get way more fires. So yeah, there are parts during the like Cretaceous and other time periods where you seem to get loads of fires on Earth everywhere. It's probably because oxygen is so high, which is quite interesting. At the same oh, time, you get okay. these huge insects. <laughs> Oh yeah, the uh, the I, I don't want to think about that. that. That terrifies me. But yeah, thank you for answering my question. Um, I do believe we have one more question left uh, from our viewers, and this one is from Jade. Uh, and this one's for you, Mark. Um, is there a correlation between the amount of wildfires to the rate of industrialization over history? Oh, that's a great that's a great question. I'm going to have to think about that for a second. Um, I think what I would say, Jade, so yeah, that is, you've, you've saved that to the end, <laughs> uh, is that there is probably a correlation between population numbers and wildfire potentially. Um, but I mean, if you think about pre-industrial era, right, actually, you know, humans were much, you know, in our everyday lives, we came across fire much more. If you think about it, like at the center of everybody's lives, we had like a hearth, you know, that all the fireplace. I know some people don't have fireplaces. Um, and, you know, you would use fire for warmth, to keep light to extend length of the day. Um, what we've essentially done since industrialization, we've taken that sort of, that uncontained fire, we put it in the center of a, you know, internal combustion engine. So we don't really see fire anymore, most of us. I mean, I don't have a fireplace, I've got a gas boiler, right? Um, so actually, fire has become much more controlled. So I don't think it's as simple to say, it's like when you get more installations, you get more wildfire. I think as you get more people, perhaps you get more, you can get more wildfire because, you know, pe people are a really important ignition source of fire on Earth. Not everywhere. There are some parts of the planet today where actually, you know, lightning is far more important than people, but there are other parts of the planet, like the UK, where actually people starting fires um, is still more important. But usually that's sort of like, you know, when they're out with a barbecue or, you know, with those old cars that heat up and used to touch grass and set fires that way. So I don't think it's as neat to say as there's a neat correlation correlation because actually for many of us in our modern lives we don't really see naked fire anymore it's kind of a rarity for us whereas for you know just four or five generations back it certainly wouldn't have been so i think the answer to that question is it's complicated so i hope that, i hope that answers your question jade but it's a good one i'll have to think about that a bit more i think all right brilliant thank you very much um and i do believe that that is pretty much the end of our uh, session tonight so thank you everybody for coming and thank you for our speakers can we get a round of applause in the comments for our speakers and their excellent talks so we're going to leave it there hope you have a nice rest of your night and hopefully we'll see you again good night <laughs>